everyone. Welcome to episode number 531 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. We're talking about intelligent modularity, a holistic approach for rugged system development, and robotic jellyfish that can clean up the ocean. <laughs> yes, my guest this week is Bill Pallad from LCR Embedded Systems, and we're chatting all about how intelligent modularity can make chassis design more efficient, how parametric design can enable reuse and reconfiguration in rugged system development, and how these approaches reflect a holistic approach to military and aerospace design. And also this week, in a different kind of rugged environment, I explore how a new type of robotic jellyfish can clean up ocean debris without touching it. All right, so before we get into the details of those robotic jellyfish, please welcome Bill from LCR Embedded Systems. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Okay, so first off, Bill, for my audience who may not know, what is LCR Embedded Systems all about? Oh, okay, that's a good one. LCR is, is a enclosure system provider, mostly. We do backplanes and IO panels for the rugged military market. We predominantly build systems and architectures based on the Vita form factor, namely VPX. This company has been around technically for 37 years, but we bought a company that's been around for 60. So we have a large pedigree and experience with military customers for quite some time and are a major provider for many large military programs. So Bill, at this year's Embedded Tech Trends Conference, your talk centered around LCR's holistic approach for rugged system development. So can you tell me more about that? What exactly do you mean by a holistic approach here? Well, so the point of that is talking about the challenges of building embedded systems for the military in a rugged environment and platform. A lot of parameters have to be looked at holistically in the sense that you have to look at a temperature, where the environment is, the ruggedization levels that are required in order to make the mission successful. You can't pull on one thing like time or money to make something successful. You have to actually look at all the parameters. And this kind of goes into the second question because they're all kind of related about how we approach these things is we look at every facet that touches our enclosure be it the open standard or where it meets the platform. And then we optimize accordingly without breaking the specification that we're given. You also mentioned intelligent modularity, which makes chassis design more efficient. So can you explain more about that? Yeah, so this holistic design goes into this modularity approach. So we could, and we have and in the past, built everything from the ground up in the sense that either the specification or the platform or some requirement comes in that you have to design everything from bottom up. And it takes a long time to do that. So what we've come up with is more of a modular approach, sort of like hanging a system off of a space frame where we can rapidly change just components of the system without throwing away everything that we've done before in the past to optimize for different platform needs. The example I gave was that if we had an air cool environment in which you needed a fan to cool the system, we can provide the fin stock and a, a system that mount on the side. But correspondingly, if a platform had a liquid type of capability where you can cool the system with liquids or there was some other type of cooling approach, we could remove those fins and put a cooling system on the side of the panels. And that would allow us to use the same backplane IO panel and infrastructure and then leverage to the new cooling for the platform without changing anything else. And that's just an example, but there's more components like that that can evolve with you know simple modular design and backplane as well as the IO panel to make this truly a very flexible design for all the different missions and different form factors that we run across. 
Let's also talk about parametric design, which you also mentioned in your presentation. This allows for reuse and reconfiguration in this arena, right? Yeah, so this is where the, the holistic and the, the modular form factor all kind of come together. What we have done is parameterize or made variables in our software that take the 8,000 decisions that goes into an enclosure or the enclosure types and really reduces it down to about eight decisions. So it's a very disruptive way of uh, improving our capability and getting our time to theater uh, quicker than, than our competition. Like I said in my talk, our competition really is our customers. They have the capability of doing everything we can do. So the way that LCR differentiates, survives in the industry is that we're quicker. And to be able to come up with a almost custom approach to what the customer sees and wants with very few parameter changes and, and capability with the modular type of capability, you just tell what kind of cooling, you tell what kind of payload, you tell what type of I.O., and instantly by the software you get basically what you want it for the platform. And this is the power and this is what we really leverage in our designs to make LCR successful. And it's what we've learned over the course of 60 years of building these type of systems. All right, Bill, let's look into your crystal ball. Now, what do you see are the biggest challenges or issues to solve on the horizon? Well, you know, it's always been the same story since the beginning of time. You think that we'd have it all solved by now. But, you know, the acronym that we use all the time is size, weight, and power. But now more than ever, and more increasing with this artificial intelligence and machine learning type of algorithms that are coming down the pipe that make these systems so powerful, it's really cooling these very, very powerful systems. We put some rules of thumb with some of the architectures and technology that we deploy, like the conduction cooled systems, around 70 watts. And then you can play around with it with some air type of uh, systems called air flow through or, or similar, and they're limited to about 100 watts. Well, some of the newer processors, some of the baseline Intel processors are starting at 200. And we're seeing this even increase to 1,000 watt processors. So now the challenge in the industry is how do we leverage what we've done for 60 years and migrate this to the newer technology or to something fundamental within the way the military complex deploys systems have to change. My opinion is that it'll probably be easier for the military to change their platforms than for the industry to make the parts cooler. I think that there always will be need for laptops and iPhones, and they're not going to be as power hungry, but the machine learning type of capability that the warfighters and the market needs, it seems to be pointing that we're going to need better or more high-powered cooling architectures. In my opinion, it will be some sort of liquid-based system. And that's only because if you look at the amount of heat exchange between air and water, it's about a thousand times more powerful to use water than air. We all know this. And in order to achieve the size and the weight and the power constraints necessary to, to cool some of these larger processors, the swap requirements, I think liquid is just the only way to go. And my evidence is not so much the military, which takes a while for them to make their opinions and change. You look at the top green computers, which is like the top supercomputers list. And the top 10 green computers, that's the amount of processing per watt. They're all liquid cooled. So if the industry or the commercial industry that builds these very, very large computers are migrating to a liquid cooled solution, I think it's just a matter of time for the military to do the same. All right. Well, Bill, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, Bill, you get my standard off-the-cuff. So, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the planet, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? Well, there's a place called Los Dos Molinos and the Habanero Steak, which is like literally five miles from here would be a, a good first place. I'm pretty spoiled where I live up in Boston, where we have all kinds of variety of food, but the uh, Mexican food is probably the best in the world, so I, I do miss it. I used to come to Arizona quite often, and being able to go get a good Mexican meal here is, uh, is a treat. Yes, it is indeed. That sounds delicious. Well, Bill, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. 
Could robotic jellyfish help us clean up the most delicate areas of our oceans? Maybe so. So get this, a team of researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems have discovered that the flapping motion of their new robotic jellyfish can not only propel these robots through the water, but also pull up debris from the ocean floor at the same time, without any contact at all. And this could be a great way to remove trash from the most delicate ocean environments, like coral reefs. Okay, so let's get into the details. These jellyfish-inspired underwater robots are only about the size of your hand and are comprised of a series of six actuators that are filled with hazels, or artificial mussels. These muscles are really interesting because they are basically oil-filled sacs covered with electrodes. Now, when they receive a current, they become filled with a positive charge, and then they discharge that current into the negatively charged ocean water that surrounds them. It's this cycle of movement that causes their artificial muscles to move back and forth, thereby causing the actuators to perform that jellyfish-like flapping movement. Okay, so where does the trash collection come from? Well, that flapping movement actually creates a current in the water, and that current can push particles upward toward the robot. Think a plunger unclogging a drain. First author of the associated research paper, Tian Lu Wang, says this about the functionality of these new underwater robots. In this way, it can also collect nutrients. Our robot, too, circulates the water around it. This function is useful in collecting objects such as waste particles. It can also transport the litter to the surface, where it can be later recycled. It is also able to collect fragile biological samples, such as fish eggs. Meanwhile, there is no negative impact on the surrounding environment. The interaction with aquatic species is gentle and nearly noise-free. So, these robots are nearly silent and can gather debris from the ocean floor without touching it. But they can actually do more than that. This team was also able to demonstrate that this robot can grab things as well when two of the actuators are brought together in a pincher-style gesture. And two robots can even work together to lift more complicated items off the ocean floor, like face masks. So, are there going to be fleets of jellyfish robots sent out into the ocean right away? Probably not, because now these jellyfish bots need to be attached to a wire to receive power. But this team contends that they are working on this problem right now. They have already outfitted a new sample robot with a wireless communication unit and a battery, and are conducting experiments with it in the pond at the Max Planck Stuttgart campus. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about these jellyfish bots, I've posted a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description for this episode as well, including a link to the associated research paper called A Versatile Jellyfish-Like Robotic Platform for Effective Underwater Propulsion and Manipulation. And I've also included a video of these bad boys in action as well. You should check them out. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978 and hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. 
and we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Also, if you'd like more information about the topics covered in this week's show, I've included a slew of links on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com and in the YouTube description as well, including a link to Bill Pilod's presentation at this year's Embedded Tech Trends Conference. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 12th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs> <laughs>